I was lucky enough to race um, from 83 to 89. I, I, I came here for curiosity. Um, our last Formula One race, I did five years in Formula One. Our last Formula One Grand Prix was the US Grand Prix in uh, Las Vegas in, in 82. And three or four weeks later, I got a call. Would I have an interest in racing an IndyCar at Phoenix? I had no idea where the track was. I didn't know it was an oval. I knew nothing about it. That's how little I knew of IndyCar racing. We had seen two IndyCar races when they came to race at Silverstone and at Brands Hatch in England in 78, I think it was. And we just knew they were, you know, massive engines and smaller tires than F1 and Bobby Unser and Mario Andretti and, you know, names like that. So at the end of our, uh, for the 83 season, I, got, I, I thought I'd like to race at Indy. I mean, we thought we were impressive doing lap speeds of 150 miles an hour average in Formula One. Um, and they were doing 200 miles an hour here. And the interesting thing for a European road racer is they were doing it between two concrete walls. And so, but I was, I was curious about the speed, curious about the history, just curious about the names. Rick Mears had just come and tested the Brabham Formula One car and he was really fast. So that sort of get the, got the buzz going a bit that, you know, there's a lot of really quick guys in America. So I came in 83 as a rookie, had no intention of staying. I just came for curiosity and I never left. I still live in Indianapolis today. It's been, my whole life changed when I came to Indianapolis to the Indy 500 for, for, for many reasons. But the, the, the fascinating thing is the speed. I mean, people are like, you know, how can they keep going faster? Remember when they got to 150 miles an hour, Pernelli Jones, and people thought, well, they can never go faster. And then 200 miles an hour came with Tom Sneever, the gas man. And of course, then ground effects came in in the, in the 80s. And, you know, ground effects were the ability to suck the car onto the ground, like an aeroplane. You know, um, the, the wings that you see in the front and the back of the cars, all they are aeroplane wings flipped upside down. An airplane at 200 miles an hour flies off into the sky. Take the wings and turn them upside down. Now think of 200 miles an hour. I think one just landed on the top of the hotel here. But think about flip the wings upside down. Now at 200 miles an hour, it drives itself down into the ground. And that's what downforce is. And that's why the speeds have gone up so much because at 200 miles an hour, they'll weigh, or they'll generate in excess of 4,000 pounds of downforce. They only weigh 1,500 pounds. So think about it. Theoretically, an IndyCar at 200 miles an hour can actually run upside down along the roof. It has that much suction. And that's why today, when you get into turn one or two or three or four, they can just keep their foot flat on the gas and just maintain the speed all the way through the downside of it is if something goes wrong. And the key to going fast is keep peeling away as much downforce as you dare to still stay flat in the corners. But the more downforce you peel away, the faster you shoot down the straight. And you, you forever play the game of the compromise. How fast do you want to go down the straight versus how fast do you want to maintain it through the corners? And the speeds now are so fast that the human reaction can no longer react fast enough when the car gets away from you. So when the car slides away, some of you probably saw some of the accidents during early practice uh, this month here. As soon as it gets away, there is no catching the car. You, you, you just can't steer into the slide as we all got taught in our road racing early junior development years. You can no longer have the ability, you don't have the ability to, to steer into the slide. And so you lose it at these type of speeds and you're going to create a big autograph on the wall and usually it hurts. Even though they walk away, usually it hurts. They bang their knees, they're bruised, their shoulders are sore, their hands are sore, something is sore. The effects don't just disappear. But isn't it hard to believe that you can actually hit a wall at 200 miles an hour and literally get out and walk away 
and ask your team, when will the spare car be ready? It's, it's an unbelievable situation to think that we have developed the sport to that level that you can actually do that. And three years ago, when did Hinchcliffe crash? Was it three, three years ago had the, had, had the big crash? Remember Hinchcliffe crashed no, in, in practice? This year too. And, and this year too. Well, right, exactly. So there are unbelievable stories of gladiators who strap themselves into these cars to try and go man and machine against man and machine to see who can be successful. And that's what drives them. It's, it, it's trying to do something that very few people in the world can get to do. And so three years ago, Hinchcliffe was minding his own business at 228 miles an hour when the right front rocker broke on the suspension. And when he turned in, of course, the car, the suspension sat down, the car absolutely drilled the wall so hard, but it drilled it perfectly in line with the front wishbone of the car. It was punched in through the car like a spear. It went in through his leg, severed his um, uh, uh, artery, and went up through his butt cheek and out through his back. And so when the doctor arrived, he was impaled in the car. But the most remarkable thing is that doctors are trained to recognize how to deal with trauma of racing cars. And the doctor recognized how bad this was. By the time they called the code in that we need to get him to hospital as quickly as possible, there's an automatic sequence of events they've now set up that the doctor says we've got to get him to hospital. The ambulance is already prepped. The police are already notified to stop all the traffic. The ambulance can leave and go um, uh, on a free run right to the hospital, who are already prepped and ready to accept the patient. And he lost 14 pints of blood between the time he hit the wall and he got to the operating room. And without that medical situation, without all the devices in place, without all the triggers that happen, Drivers can die today unless we have that in place. And drivers died in the past. When I raced here for the first time, one in every seven drivers died. When I was in Formula One, it was one in every eight. But in the five years I was there, five of my friends died. I heard an unbelievable statistic last night that Mario Andretti had 57 of his friends die in racing cars. Isn't that amazing? But that part of history. Is part, of, is, what is part of the draw to Indianapolis, because it's the biggest stage in the world. This is where the history was made with people like that daring to go out into that world to see what might be possible. But the amazing thing, it still amazes me today, Hinchliff came back the next year and put it on the pole. This year he goes out, has a monster crash flips the car almost upside down, and within a couple of hours, he was back in the spare car, re ready to go again. I mean, how many people have that ability to mentally block that out and go back to something that almost killed you three years ago and could do it again easily? And that's part of the draw of the Indy 500. Very few people in the world ever get to do it. And the draw for the drivers is that it's, it's the satisfaction of trying to see how far you can push yourself, how many team members of the team around you can you drive to work day and night to give you the car, how much information can you read at 225 miles an hour? Can you feel what the car does? Can you relay that information to your engineer? Can he then put himself in the seat by what you say and the picture you paint? Can he then adjust the car to make it go faster? Because a racing car cannot go any faster than the racing car can physically go. But if you can keep tuning it like an engineer, and make it go faster, you go to the line, the starting line, at a race like tomorrow with potentially a better car than the guys around you. And that's the challenge, the, 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 sort of the, the, the challenge that really not, not a lot of people talk about, about the value 
of accurate feedback from drivers like Scott Dixon, who over all these years has this consistency about him that no matter how bad the car is, he has the ability to just work through the setups. And if he doesn't have the winning car on that particular day, he'll be second or third, but he's a great championship driver. But this month of May has been unusual for so many reasons. I mean, we have storylines every year. I spent the last 30 years doing local television broadcasts here, and we forever have storylines that are intriguing. But in recent years, probably none more so than th this year. Why? Because of McLaren and Fernando Alonso, and what might he do? Can he come over with the McLaren team themselves? Can they take on the might of Penske and Ganassi and Andretti, and what might it be like? Tomorrow, he's in Spain, watching on television and just asking himself, you know, what went wrong? It doesn't take a lot to go wrong these days, because never in the history of this race has the pole position and the last place qualifier been closer than they are this year. 2.7 miles an hour covers front to back. 2.7 miles an hour is less than a second. It's about just over 0.7 of a second. Over four miles, or four laps, 10 miles. So it's never been closer. So the window to be competitive is so small now that you really can't put a one race brand new team together that's never had IndyCar experience before and hope to come and take on the might of the big teams here. And once it goes wrong, once you get off on the wrong foot, even though there's five days of practice, it's almost impossible to catch up. It is so unbelievably difficult to catch up. And the spiral for McLaren started on the very first day. I mean, they just, they had an electrical issue, lost most of the first day. And then he crashed. Uh, and, and the crash was very simple, very simple. I mean, it just carried a bit too much speed into a corner, understeer, which is when the car won't steer around the corner. He just brushed it, hoping to get away with it, but it spun, hit the inside wall, and now you have to build another car. I didn't realize until the four crashes this year, but you're not allowed to have a spare car sitting there. You actually have, you're not allowed to have an engine in the car. So the teams have to go to work immediately to put an engine in th into the car. Now McLaren didn't even have it that uh, uh, ready. And it took them, they missed the next day. So you see how their, their issues just multiplied and multiplied. And then they began to panic um, on the last day with one more uh, day of qualifying. They're trying to get some Penske set up, trying to get some shock absorbers from Andretti. And, and I know with the fine, tiny window that these teams now operate in, you can't just hope to bolt on a set of shock absorbers and hope that they magically will work and give you the grip you need. So Fernando goes out there and, I mean, he goes flat, but he goes flat with too much downforce on. The rear right height was too low, was hitting the ground. So when you see sparks coming out of the underside of a car, which we saw in his final practice session, it's like putting the brakes on every time it hits the ground. At the, at the speed they run, it's just break, 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 and they, they finally run out of time. And in fairness to them, they stood up and licked their own wounds and said, it's our fault. Fernando said, we don't deserve to be in this race if we can't come with a representative uh, team and, 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 and ability to go this fast. And I, I have no idea whether they'll be back or not, but I, I think they will because the McLaren supercar that they build is so popular and the American market is so big, they want to come back to what is the, you know, the largest single day attended sports event in the world. So I hope, I hope they are back. Um, I hope they come back strong. I think it will be a tremendous addition to the IndyCar season if McLaren with that papaya orange color could come back on a, on a full-time basis. <laughs> So once a car is qualified for the race, you can't swap 
the car, but you can swap the driver. And so let's say Servia, who does one race a year, was somehow offered a million dollars to go on a Spanish vacation <laughs> tonight and let Fernando, another Spaniard, jump into his seat. You actually can do that. You can do that. Ryan Hunter Ray with DHL sponsorship, the first year they sponsored him with the Andretti team, failed to qualify. They went to AJ Foyt and said to Bruno Giacomelli, no, Bruno Jonquera, why don't you send him to a Brazilian vacation, which they did. And Ryan Hunter Ray got into his car, yellow decaled, and he was in the race. And, that, and DHL became a sponsor for the rest of that, that season and for ongoing seasons. So there are, reasons, there are reasons to do it. But Fernando said, no, if we don't deserve to be in the race, it just it isn't ethical for us to buy our way in. And believe it or not, it's interesting that you bring that up, Jeff, because can you imagine the stench that would have given oh, to McLaren in general? That they weren't good enough, so they had to write a check and buy their way in? You know, you couldn't buy publicity that bad. <laughs> and so that's, that, that's a large part of the reason why, you know, unless they can earn their position, they just, they just, don't, they just don't want to be here. But to see the 2.7 mile an hour spread front to back, I bet you that would scare any other Formula One team for trying to think, we'll go and show those Yanks what we're able to do from Formula One, because it's just not that easy here. It just isn't that easy. Yeah. Um, anybody guess who my favorite driver is at the Indy 500? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just happen to have, I just happen to have a son who happens to have the best ride he's ever had at Indy in the U.S. Air Force jet fighter run by Andretti. And it is, well, the very first day he tested, he called me. He said, Dad, they do stuff I've never even heard of. <laughs> that was the difference in the engineering and what they do to try and make these cars go faster. So, for example, there's four uprights on the car. There's bearings. and puts, puts grease in the bearings. They have worked with BASF to develop an almost frictionless fluid they can put into these bearings that will last four laps at Indy. So the car rolls down the road freer. They've developed all sorts of frictionless materials um, to try and make the gearbox just easier to roll. All the small little things you don't think of. They spend months and months fitting the bodywork so there's no gaps um, 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 to st potentially create drag to slow the car down. When they put decals on the car, they put them on before they put the last clear coat on the paint because the width of the decal is too wide and it creates vortexes as it goes down the road at 200 miles an hour. Can you believe this? All to try and get maybe a half a mile an hour. And if you got a half a mile an hour today, just look at the grid sheet and look at half a mile an hour between rows one or three or three or five or seven or 10. It's unbelievable the difference it makes. And all these small little things are what all the experienced teams know. You better do this if you want to have a car that r runs at the front. And so he got no testing. Uh, well, very little testing because it rained on the test day back here in April. Um, but they rolled out, and, and he, he was reasonably happy with the car almost immediately. And what these teams do is they have a test program. Like, so Andretti has five cars. They will divvy up, look, we want to try 10 things on this car. We're going to try 10 on this, 10 on this, and they have a program that every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, however it works out, no matter what the driver says, if he doesn't like it, you still have to test it and go through it and get feedback. So as the next day, they cut it down to five things per car. So as they go through all the small things that will help make the car go faster, and then they share the information between the team. And so by the time day two and three and four comes, each driver is beginning to tailor what he likes in his car to his feel and his style, and hopefully the cars get closer and closer to the front of the grid. Well, Fast Friday, um, Connor set the fastest lap 
of fastest speed of the month of May, 231.7 miles an hour, I think, faster than anybody else. And in fact, he said there was even more in it. Um, and, and, and so that's the type, I mean, he's never been at the top of the charts before at Indy. So can you imagine the confidence a driver gets when he's got an engineering group in his pit and on his radio that's asking him, what can we give you? What do you need? What more do you want? What type of feel do you want? And that they're able to translate that into changes that then translate into speed on the racetrack. And I mean, for a driver, it's a tremendous comfort. He's never had it before. He, he, he was Alonzo last year. Last year, he got bumped out of the race three times. And, four, and, and, and he had to try and requalify four different times before he eventually made it into the field. And so now the real challenge is, after qualifying was over, Monday, which is set aside for full tank race prep running. They fill the fuel tank up. They all go out and practice as if it's racing lots of traffic. It was 62 degrees. So cool air makes more downforce. Cool, dense air makes more downforce. So it was almost impossible to replicate what may happen tomorrow in the 80 degrees, 83, whatever it might be tomorrow. Because in that type of temperature, the oil that's in the racetrack and the rubber from the tires that runs over it, they all get, gets a bit oily because it gets so hot, bubbles to the surface. The air temperature is so hot, like an airplane in Denver can't take off because it's so hot and it's high, high uh, altitude, so you've got to go long, longer runs. So all these things factor into the aerodynamics of how to try and make the cars fast. Well, they couldn't do that last Monday. So they did a bit on carb day, and now tomorrow, they actually don't even know what might happen. What if it rains, well, let's say, what if it rains tonight? It already rained today. When it rains, it washes the rubber that's down. The rubber is the groove. You've heard people say, you know, you, you keep it in the groove. You'll see the groove build up on race day. It just gets more black because after 100 laps, there'll be 3,300 laps with a worn rubber on the ground. The more rubber that goes down, the more grip you get because rubber against rubber has more grip. And so the real magic is with the drivers who can keep balancing the car, keep adjusting the front and the rear wings to suit the amount of rubber and the temperature at that particular time. And the driver who can give that accurate feedback to his engineer and keep adjusting the car can potentially have himself in a position in the last 50 miles to make a real run for a potential win. Rick Muir said the Indy 500, the first 400 miles, all it is is just to position yourself to race in the last 100 miles. And he won it four times. Who would ever argue with a guy like that who's such a specialist here? So my hope, and I'll be on his, <laughs> I'll be on his radio tomorrow. I will listen to all, I listen to all his, uh, the driver feedback. Um, my hope is that he can get himself in a position to be in a challenge for, you know, that top group. But the interesting thing is, you never know. You just don't know. Part of the intrigue of Indy is you know they're pushing right out to the edge of the limit. You're not quite sure what the guy ahead of you can do. If he gets in trouble, he can take you with him. So that's the intrigue of this place. You just don't know. What might happen? Yes, sir. What row is he? Connor is uh, the middle of row four between Marco Andretti and Elio Castro Neves. Right right yeah, right yeah, right yeah. Oh, he, he is right in the middle of the mix. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday, yesterday was carb day. Was it yesterday? Yeah. His very first flying lap, right? He did four. He, he, he drives out. They did four practice pit stops. They call them hot stops. For practice pit stops first, then they put a set of tires on. His very first hot lap by was 224 miles an hour, which is P10. Now, although it wasn't the fastest of the day, what it tells me and tells the team is he had enough confidence to go flat into turn one on the very first hot lap. So we're hoping that translates into that same confident feel for him tomorrow when they're all charging down into turn one. Um, and then down the back straight. A little dad in him. Little dad in him? <laughs> no, he doesn't fight as much as me. Yeah. You would imagine that if he wins, Derek, that he would have a full-time seat next year. Well, so, um, 
you know, might he have a full-time seat if he, if he wins tomorrow? I, I, I don't know. That, that's the other intriguing thing about racing. It's so expensive. So the budget has to come from somewhere. Just about every single driver on the grid has some connection to the sponsorship on their car. So pick anybody. Sato. Sato, right? He wins the Indy 500. Sato is there because Honda pays the bill because he's such a hero in Japan. And Panasonic also contributes to paying him. Now, the reason they do it is because he is such a national hero in Japan for the J Japanese to send their hero to America and win the biggest race. It's a huge national pride story for the Japanese. So I understand it completely. I just want the US to feel the same way. <laughs> US Air Force. Yes. yes. Uh, Connor is 27. He started when he was 10. Yeah, started racing carts when he was 10. And when he grew up, I mean, obviously, there, 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 when he was a, a baby, there was um, uh, a thing called Racing Babies, which was a babysitting service under the grandstand at turn four. He was in the babysit service from the time he was nothing, you know, crawling around. So he's always been exposed to it. Um, but there was no plan to necessarily get him to become a race car driver. Um, when he was 10, he was at a go-kart track. And he just said, Dad, do you think I could have a go? And I mean, he played football in school and basketball. He was born here, yeah, yeah. Um, so he played sports, but you know, he, he, he's very much like me. I was not a gifted athlete. I played rugby in school, but I had to work hard at it. You know, I wasn't a natural balance athlete. And he's very much the same, but as soon as he sat into a go-kart, bang, easy. He just instinctively knew what to do. Um, and I told him, I said, I will help you in every possible way as long as you're pulling me through the sport. I'm not going to pull you because you have to want this because this is way too dangerous and way too expensive for me to be pulling you because I don't need to live vicariously through you. And once he understood that, you know, he had to drive the ship. I mean, he had to want to do this. Um, he, w he went through the karting, went through the junior series here, junior development series, then he went to Europe for four years. He was contracted to Force India Formula One at one stage as a, as a development driver. But I don't know whether you know Connor, I've seen him. He is very American, very Indianapolis, very Indy 500. He said he loves the place so much. So even though he was doing GP3 in 2013, um, uh, we began to talk to AJ Foyt, to, to give him his rookie debut. Um, um, and so in the middle of his GP3 series in 2013, he came back to do the Indy 500. And, and, and then he said, Dad, I, I, I want to race here. I, I, this, is just, this just means too much to me. And I can understand that. I mean, you know, he grew up here. And so to, ha to have him have the US Air Force, an all-American guy on Memorial Weekend, tell me if there isn't a better storyline. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the car looks like a jet fighter. I mean, it's got the shark teeth. It's got, it's, it's got everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the grid tomorrow with him will be um, uh, General Major General Jeannie Levitt, who was the first female fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force. How cool is that? Yeah. So it's it's got all it's got all the great storylines. So as you can imagine, I don't give a shit about Alonzo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Really interesting question because uh, the question is, what does a driver have to do to prepare for a race like this? So, if you if you asked anybody, if you asked anybody, name an athlete, they'll probably say you know a football player, a basketball player, because that's what you consider an, an athlete to be. I did a really interesting test at the Long Beach Grand Prix, 1984. They monitored my heartbeat over the course of the two hours of the Long Beach Grand Prix. My average heartbeat for two hours was 178 beats per minute, average, with a high of 199. I, uh, um, and, and they believed, it was the Hovig Medical Group out of San Diego, they believed that their, their equipment had malfunctioned because they'd never measured sustained heartbeat that high. Since then, they've measured professional cyclists who have sustained heartbeats that high. But that was the first indication that these guys in these cars 
at such at the speeds they run with the adrenaline that pumping through their body are true athletes. And of course, think about what, an, what, what, what does an athlete need when he's hot and sweaty? Like think of a runner. What do they want? They want cool air and cool water. Well, the driver puts on five layers of clothing. It's designed to be fireproof so it doesn't breathe that well. Then he puts on a balaclava, cuts down the oxygen flow. Then he puts a helmet on. And the last thing he does is close the visor. So it's a hostile environment for, for an athlete's body because you just can't get what you need to feed it. So they spend so much time in the gym to get strong enough to get race fit faster. You cannot get race fit without being in the racing car because you can't replicate G-forces. So when they go around left-hand corners and it pulls five Gs on a regular basis, the human neck is not strong enough to hold your head up. So if you look into the cars tomorrow, Connor spent two days working with a headrest to get himself located where his head is fully located so as his neck muscles no longer have to hold his head up. And the buffeting of the air when you're in dirty air when you're behind a car no longer makes his helmet visor shrink or, uh, or uh, vibrate. So they, um, they are athletes at a much different specialized level than the athlete you might think think that as a football player. So the question is, do they experience motion sickness with, with that amount of downforce? Not at this level because it's not sustained. So in Texas, motor Texas Motor Speedway, 10 years ago maybe, I don't remember what it was. was yes, two, was it 2000? Yes. Okay, not, so 19 years ago. Texas is a high bank speedway. IndyCar went there in its iteration of Champ Car Kart, which was much faster, much faster cars, more horsepower. They had vertical Gs and horizontal Gs that added up to nine Gs total. And because there was virtually no straight, it was sustained. There were two crashes, and the driver said, I have no idea what just happened. And then the doctors went to the rest of the drivers and said, I want you to give me an honest answer. How do you feel in the banking? And the drivers began to say, we're dizzy. We're dizzy. And they worked out at that stage, the vertical G and horizontal G sustained was so much, they actually canceled the race. First time in history that they had to cancel a race because the G loads were, were, were so much. G lock. Right, yeah, so it's, it's, um, the medical term is G-lock, where you pass out. Not here because it's not heavy banking. And so when, once you take the heavy banking away and there's a long straight, it's not sustained like it is, like it is in Texas. Yeah. Do, I saw another question. Yes, sir. Do you think that McLaren came to Indy with the attitude of, well, we're a Formula One team, how tough can this be? So the question is, did McLaren potentially come to Indy thinking, we're a Formula One team, how tough can this be? <laughs> Currently not a very good Formula One team, he says. Um, I, I do not believe for a minute there was any arrogance there. However, I do believe they probably believed that they had the ability to have frictionless materials at as high, at least a high level as high a level as those guys have maybe we know even more but as it unfolded the the structure of getting everything in place quick enough was ultimately their downfall so i don't believe they did but i'm sure they thought we 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 we, we can at least get to their level and maybe have another couple of tricks ourselves in, Alonso in the books. Good last year, but he, he, he so Alonso, two years ago, two years ago. Was, was exactly where my son Connor is today. Alonso was in the fifth Andretti car. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, I see, I see teams like Foyt, Andretti, uh, Rahal Letterman, uh, Dale Coyne. I see these teams regularly add an additional car, or multiple cars, for, for the Indy 500. Seldom are they able to run it at the level of the regular cars. Andretti can. I absolutely know for certain the Andretti team has given my son 
everything they have. Everything that they knew was available is on his car. Um, and as he begins to repay that trust by going fast, like in, in, uh, in, in uh, Fast Friday, what, what do they want to do? Give him even more. Give him as much support as possible. Um, and so for a driver, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty glad you get that. Yes, sir. Any opinion on why Marco Andretti can't do as well as other ones? Right. My opinion is, well, you don't have a wheel. You think I want you going back to, hey, you were here with, you were here with Daily Z last night. So here, here's the thing. The greatest thing that could happen in IndyCar right now is for Marco to win tomorrow. 50th anniversary of Mario's win. It would be global headlines. Greatest thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ironically, after Connor's run on Fast Friday when he did 231.7, Marco went to his engineer and says, whatever we've been doing, Throw it in the bin. I want Connor Daly set up. <laughs> so he's going to go to the line tomorrow with, with Connor set up. Yeah. So, so now when he came here as a rookie, you remember what happened? He lost it by two feet. And he, he was dominating the race, could have won it, should have won it. If you look at the speed through turns three and four, he backed off too much. He went down to 219 miles an hour through turns three and four, backed off thinking, I got this handle, I don't take any chances. And Hornish was behind him in the Penske at the perfect distance behind. And Marco backs off through turn four. Hornish gets the run and passes him by two feet. And it was his rookie year, and he never had the same opportunity. So I hope he has a fair run tomorrow as long as he's looking at the US Air Force trying to catch him. <laughs> He'll never catch a jet fighter. Derek, um, on Friday, do they actually run all the tires that they're going to run for the race to do some type of curing? I know they scrub the tires, but someone told me that the, actually all the tires they're going to use the day of race day, they will all Friday, they'll like run two laps, come in, take them off. And so, kind of yeah, 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 the yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, the question is on tires. They get um, 34 sets of tires, I think, for the month of May. By the way, you can't buy tires. You lease tires. Firestone only leases the tire to you. The, the, the tire bill is $100,000 lease, and you have to give the tires back. Yeah, yeah. The tires only last 70 miles. So can you imagine the tires lasting 70 miles and only lease them? By the way, Honda and, and Chevrolet only lease the engines. You can't buy the engines. They lease them to you. If you, for a one race deal that Connor's doing here, the lease program is $300,000 just for the use of an engine. So you can imagine how expensive the program is? It's amazing. So, tires. The very first time a racing tire heats up, it goes to its hottest ever temperature that it'll achieve in its lifetime, and the hottest temperature means the most grip it'll ever have. So that's why you hear of sticker tires in qualifying, because you want to catch that magic lap of the highest heat, the highest grip. Now, if it's going to be 85 degrees tomorrow, that actually means the tires could potentially get too hot and blister and, um, um, and degrade. So to get over that, some teams, I know Pagano did it, some teams will run all of their race tires for two laps on Carb day, which they did yesterday. That two laps brings the temperature up, back down. Now it's cured once. Curing the tire one time means they've now protected it from potentially getting too hot. Their gamble is that it's going to be hot on race day. And it's, 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 such, it's such a fine decision time of what to do and how to do it. Because if you only have 10 laps to run in the race and there's one last pit stop, you want stickers. You don't care. You don't have to do 30 laps. A full st uh, stint is, is about 30, 32 laps tomorrow. 
for tanker fuel. So you see the strategic game they play all the time. I have no idea whether Connor scrubbed all his tires in or not. I think they scrubbed in at least half of them, which means they have an option as to, as to what to do. But um, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch the crew guys go through the changes they can make during a pit stop. The guy who runs out in 60 air jack in, he's also the guy that can change the rear wing because he sticks the air jack in, he reaches in, pulls a tool out of his pocket, now he can adjust the rear wing up or down. All pre-programmed um, based on the information the driver radios to the engineer and all the guys are hooked into it before he comes in for the pit stop. <laughs> Jeff. The downforce, obviously, when you're going down the straightaway and you're drafting behind somebody, and obviously you're not so much concerned about the downforce, but as you start to come out from around that car in the turn, and your car is half of your wing is behind of them and half of it's not, I mean, how much effect is that? How close so, can you be? Yeah, so the downforce issue. You know, w w when you're by yourself out leading the race, you have clean air to generate the most downforce the car can generate as efficiently as it can generate it. Anyone who remember, uh, you know the feeling you get when you follow a semi on the freeway and your car suddenly starts to move? That's exactly what an Indy car does, except it's 230 miles an hour when it does it. So it begins to move around because the air is so dirty. So the dirty air that's, that, that, that causes downforce and releases, downforce and release, downforce and release, that's what you have to manage when you're in traffic. So as much as possible, You'll see a driver who's following somebody, he'll try and go outside him on the way into the corner and cross under him so as he at least has the left front wing in clear air. If you follow him all the way through the corner, the chances are you go way into the high risk um, um, element of what could happen and you either understeer into the wall, which Graham Rahal did two years in a row coming off turn four. Just got a bit wide, followed a car, and went straight off into the wall. And the problem is, once the car leaves the groove, at 225 miles an hour, it doesn't matter if you put the brakes on. You're going to hit the wall anyway, because, because the momentum of the weight shift is so much, you are going to hit the wall. And you know it as soon as you get out of the groove. You just hope. That's you what happened to Danica and Castor Nevis, same thing. When they left, what, didn't they just leave the pits earlier? Was it was it was early after the pit stop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And last year was unusual when Danica crashed because it was it was it was a sort of accident you don't normally see. Um, but it was the first year of the new aero kits when they took away the manufactured aero kits that generated even more downforce, and that was all the the type of information that teams now have to log. Um, to try and understand the situation tomorrow, the, the, the temperature, the humidity, everything. So all the engineers go to bed tonight watching the news, watching the weather, trying to decide what to do, and then trying to react quick enough um, um, when, when, you know, when it comes to decision time in the middle of the race. That's a question I have that you mentioned about uh, going to bed at night. These guys are tough, but I mean, they, get a, they don't get a good eight-hour sleep. I mean, are they awake most of the time? Or what? Well, how about you? How, how did you handle that? So do they sleep? <laughs> um, there's a driver's lot. As far as I know, every driver stays on site. They all have motorhomes uh, in a motorhome lot just literally outside the paddock. Um, I doubt they get what we would call a good, deep, full mm -hmm. night's sleep. Because what I found, you, you, you forever run through scenarios in your mind. Like, so Connor, okay, Marco is here. Castro Nevers is here. If he gets the jump, he's in a Chevrolet. I know his top speed's a bit higher. I'll make sure I stay right behind him. But what if Marco does this over here? No, I gotta take it easy into the first corner because he got through the first two corners anyway. Yeah, but what if I get the jump? I'll go around him. Yeah, he's no good on jump. And so this scenario goes through the whole time. And of course, it never happens like that. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, and you ask a driver, did you have breakfast this morning? Very few of them will say that they have a full breakfast because they can only eat in small bites. 
because you, you, know, you, you can't just, you just don't have the ability to sit down and just chow down, you know, with big breakfast. And everybody has their own sort of um, um, scenarios that play out. Um, you know, some are superstitious. Some like to get up early and get to the racetrack and be by the car. Just, it's there. I can rub it, I can see it, smell it, feel it, and I can be around the engineers. Other people don't want to even go near the place because there's too many people. And so the distractions, as soon as a driver walks in, I mean, he is just bombarded. And so you want to be polite, yet you don't want to be distracted. So how do you play that game? You know what I mean? Well, I was just rude. <laughs> It, it's, a, it's a hard one to play. Like, I've watched Danica Patrick be just bombarded with, with people. And eventually she say, no, I've got to walk away. That one person she said no to, amazingly, that spreads through the paddock about how bad Danica Patrick is. But I fully understand. You know, you, you, sometimes you just have to switch off, go away, and, 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 and sometimes it's, it's deemed as being rude, but they do, drivers, I think IndyCar drivers, people have access to them probably more than any other significant formula uh, a racing series in, in the world. But I completely understand when there's a time to stop, drop off. Like, I, I have not spoken to Connor today. I'm not interested. You, you, you got your things to do. You, you, your engineers, your relationship this weekend. You know, I, I'm here if you have a question. And, you know, you know, the last couple of weeks, I'll drop him a couple of little pieces on a text, just a little reminder, right? Because he doesn't need dad telling him what to do. But, you know, I can't help myself. But you, but you know what I mean? You just drop little things. But, I mean, he's been around this long enough. His relationship this weekend is with his engineer and his mechanics. And when they know that, the effort, I always think, goes up. And they give everything they have. And, you know, people tell me, if you want to understand life, go in the military. I tell people, if you want to understand life, go work on a racing team. Because it is 24 hours a day sometimes. And there is no set time to go home and no set time. Um, you just have to make sure you're there whenever needed. And it is, it is it's unbelievable the amount of work and effort that goes into what goes on with these races. Okay, I could easily stay here all night, but I'll have to cut it off at some stage. Yes, sir, how are you? I just got a tweet from Connor Daly, by the way. He still likes me. Sorry, give me that again. Is it disturbing for a driver to start pretty wide in a race such as this one, whether you're in the front, the middle, or the back? The further back you are, the worse it is. Wherever you are. Yeah. Is it disturbing compared to too wide in a normal race? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's tradition here, but the further back you are, the more dirty air you have to go through, um, and you just have to factor that in. I can remember clearly my very first Indy 500, 1983. At that stage, we used straight methanol. Um, when you're going down the back on the very first lap, you're tucked right in behind the guy ahead of you who's tucked right behind the guy ahead of him. Halfway down the straight, the methanol fumes begins to get under your helmet, and your eyes begin to burn so badly that you can neither see, the tears begin to run down your eyes, but you daren't let off because you're, catching, you're trying to stay in the draft of the guy ahead of you. And that's all the things that just, you never learn that until the very first time you go down the front uh, or the back straight at Indy. And the rear view mirrors, are, they flutter like this, so all you see is blurred vision. And, that, and that's what happens in dirty air. Now, it's not as bad now with the E, corn oil, something funny thing they burn, E85, whatever it is. Yeah, it's not as bad, but it's still, it, you know, it, it's, it's still an interesting challenge. But the, for, the deeper you are, the worse it is. I t I saw, yes, sir, how are you? Good. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, not about Connor or Marco. Okay, good, great. All <laughs> um, <Are> my shoes. <laughs> I don't want to be on the stage. Yeah. Um, so how are the pit box locations yeah. determined? Right. One. Yeah. Two, how is it determined who's in the pit stop challenge? Okay. So first question, pit stop location for race day. 
the poll man gets his choice. And so Pagano, he will pick either a free run in or a free run out. So for example, gas in alley, there's a big uh, uh, gap where the cars come in and out. There's a free run out of the pit stall on the right side and a free run into the one on the left side. I don't know which one he picked, but, he, but they usually pick one of those. Second guy gets the next pick. He'll go to the next free stall, right? And so you, you, it, it goes in sequence like that. And so each driver then picks whatever is the best stall they want that, that's available to them when it comes to their pick. So Connor got his 11th pick. And so right now the Andretti team is, Herta is on the way in. He was the fifth pick. Marco, Rossi, and Connor are all on the line. And that gives the team an advantage because they can share information, literally run between engineers or team managers, uh, and also they can stagger the pit stops. So when Connor's going in, they'll know if Rossi's coming in and the, and, and the other way around, and they'll, they'll try and stagger them so they have a free run in or, or a free, team free run. The teams can decide that during the race, yeah. And your second question was what? How do they determine who's in the pit stop challenge? Oh, pit stop challenge. Um, it's, a it's open for everybody. The reason Connor's team wasn't in it is they only have one car. And so no, everybody in that pit stop challenge used their road course car from two weeks ago. They didn't use their speedway cars because they don't want to burn the clutch every time they do it. Yeah, and so Connor doesn't have a road course car. And so when Hinch, uh, um, Hinchcliffe's team won it, it was a road course car that, that they ran two weeks ago. Same with Dixon, same with Penske. And of course, those guys have plenty of cars. Yes, how are you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is on rolling starts or standing starts? She prefers standing starts. I absolutely love standing starts. Yeah. A Formula One race with a standing start, everybody's heartbeat is pounding to see what happens. Now, they have it at such a high level, very few passes happen these days. But I still think, think standing starts, I'm all for it. They tried it in IndyCar. I think they should go back to it. The reason they dropped it is because... What was the guy that stalled? Car One car stalled and there was a big crash. And that was it, knee-jerk reaction, we can never have this again. But I'm a big fan of standing starts. I, I think they should do it more often. But, but I don't think they will because it's an IndyCar thing. Do you know what I mean by that? It's like this is the way we've always done it. And I think they've fallen into that you know, sense of security now that they're just going to keep it that way. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. They're, theoretically, they have um, timing loops. They're supposed to be able to know, but, but, but it's, it, it's, it's a fudge factor. I agree. I agree. It is very much so. I saw one more hand up here. I'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Sir, in 2017, it seems like the Honda engine was really Some manufacturer has a So does one manufacturer have an advantage, Chevrolet Honda? Chevrolet have a speed advantage here, without a doubt. They are able to pull out and pass on the straight. We yet don't know whether they have the fuel consumption that a Honda can have. And that can play into it. Because if you get your car to go one more lap, two and a half miles, the advantage can just keep mounting up all through the race. And the hope is that you can do one stop less. And as of today, we, we actually don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. The worst thing that can happen, for me personally, is that Chevrolet has good fuel consumption and good power. Did Rossi prove that on the 100? Well, OK, so, so that's an interesting question. Rossi proved that on the 100. He actually didn't prove that. What he did on the 100th anniversary, the team made a mistake. Rossi's team, Andretti, made a mistake on the second, on the last pit stop, they couldn't get fuel in, right? They couldn't get fuel in, they had to bring them back in again, 
Then they filled him up. Now he's last. He's in 29th position. They look at the number of laps. They look at what can play out, and they realize we have no chance. The only way we can win this is you have to pedal this thing as slowly as you can and finish, and we hope that everybody ahead of you is going to have to peel off and get fuel. They gave him a fuel number, 4.7, I think it was. He said, no way. Cannot. That's your number. Make it. And, and of course, they began to peel off. He began to move up. And, and, and then this thing became real, and he was going just about fast enough and rolled across the line with the engine dead. I mean, it'll, it may never, ever happen again. Yeah, never made it all the way around. So it may, not, may never happen again. Okay, thank you all so much. Let me just tell you one thing. Let me just tell you one thing. Tomorrow, as, as, I, as, as I say to people, some of you have been here before, but, and you know this is the largest single day attended sports event in the world, but history will be made again tomorrow. And there is more history at this racetrack than any place else in the world. And we'll all watch the Monaco Grand Prix in the morning, and you realize that that's their crown jewel. But it doesn't have near the history of what goes on here. And I think the danger level of what goes on here is part of what the history is. And so you're all going to be there tomorrow to enjoy it. I hope it's a safe race. I hope it's a great race. I hope you all enjoy it. I hope you all have suntan lotion. And I hope every one of you cheers for the U.S. Air Force. And if you don't, I'll know about it, right? Thank you all so much. Enjoy tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Go, Connor. <laughs>